a tutorial today on deep slab instability, which is uh, very confusing to a lot of people, including professionals. And a lot of people mistakenly uh, focus on the strong layers in the snowpack instead of the weak layers in the snowpack. Now, the strong layers are avalanches. The weak layers create the avalanches. With deep slab instability, it's very confusing, even to pros, uh, because uh, of a number of things. And uh, the stronger the overlying slab the more and the more persistent the buried weak layer, the more tricky it is. So let me explain how some of this stuff works. Here's a snow profile. And on the vertical axis, we have depth. So this is one meter, about three feet deep. And then this is the hardness of the snow. So this is fist, four fingers, one finger, pencil, knife. So the harder, the more these stick out, the harder the snow is. Down here, this red layer is the weak layer. This is facetous snow, or depth hoar, uh, which is facetous snow buried at depth. And that's the problem. So it's on the bottom of the snowpack, very, very weak, very fragile. And then on top of that, we have the old proverbial brick on top of a pile of potato chips. We have a hard slab. And the harder the slab is, the trickier it is. And then we have some snow on top. Now, um, these, this depth hoar layer is what we call a persistent weak layer. In other words, it lasts for a long time after it's been uh, buried and continues to produce avalanches a long time after it's been loaded with snow. And the slab in the middle is what a lot of people call a bridging slab. By bridging, it means that it spreads your weight outwards and it does not transmit as much weight to the underlying slab. So it's harder, or the underlying weak wet layer rather. So it's harder to trigger an avalanche because it's kind of like a, a piece of plywood on your mattress. If you're sitting on that, it spreads your weight out and you're less likely to trigger the, the collapse of deep, the weak layer underneath it, if that makes sense. And then finally on top, we have what is sometimes called sucker snow. Uh, so it's nice powder and it lures people onto the uh, dangerous conditions. And so it feels solid because you got a nice hard slab underneath, so it feels safe, but they, there are monsters lurking in the basement. So uh, if we look at uh, instability versus time, and here's a storm right here. So the instability is low, and then when the storm comes, it loads it up with a weight. Now, snow does not like rapid change, so it, the instability goes way up. But after the storm, the snowpack starts gaining strength. The weak layers start to adjust to their load, and uh, it gains strength. So with less persistent weak layers, it gains strength pretty quickly. With medium uh, persistent weak layers, it takes a little bit longer, and with real persistent weak layers like we have right now, it takes many, many days uh, for uh, the snowpack to quit producing avalanches after it's been loaded with weight. And that's what makes it so tricky even to a lot of the avalanche professionals. With these persistent weak layers, they have to be equally matched with persistent patience. And that's what makes them so deadly. And that's one of the reasons that most avalanche fatalities occur at the middle danger levels, or considerable in this case, level three. Um, and let me explain some of that. Here is uh, danger, avalanche danger on the bottom of the scale. And if we're going to plot avalanche hazard, the avalanche hazard actually increases. It about doubles with each notch in the danger rating. Um, so it's a geometric progression. It's much more dangerous up here than down here. So if we plot people on the same curve, this is what we get. So when it's low danger, it's usually because it hasn't snowed for a while, and the conditions are not that great, not that many people out there. But during or just after a storm, our danger rating is usually level 2 or level 3. And that's when most people are out, because after a storm, but then, as soon as we start using the magic word high, for some reason, people pay it attention to high, but the word considerable just does not sound very dangerous. But yet, the, da the definition of considerable is dangerous conditions and human-triggered avalanches are likely. So that's a big problem. 
uh, is just the perception of this level three avalanche danger. So, of course, the problem comes when you mix people with avalanche hazard. And of course, the combination between those two is what's under the curve. And that's why most avalanche fatalities occur at level three or considerable danger, the maximum interaction between people and avalanches. So let's plot this on uh, another chart. So here's dangerous avalanche conditions, medium, or, or terrain rather, medium, and usually safe terrain. And here's the scale that I showed you before. And of course, up here you have travel not recommended, higher risk terrain because you're combining dangerous terrain with dangerous snowpack. Here we have green, low risk um, conditions because we're combining uh, low danger snowpacks with low danger or medium danger terrain. In the middle, this is where the problems occur. So, this is fun because we're going into dangerous terrain only when conditions are safe. So that's what, the way we're supposed to do it. Up here, this is just crazy because we're combining dangerous conditions with dangerous terrain. That obviously does not make sense. And this is where most avalanche accidents occur because it's experts only, and a lot of people think that they know more about avalanches than they do, and they're pushing the terrain. They really should be down here at medium terrain or usually safe terrain. Instead, they're pushing it into dangerous terrain. So what do I mean by that? Um, I'll explain that in a second. So the way to reduce your risk is, of course, to go to safer terrain or go to safer snowpack. So here, uh, the, the red ones on the top are factors that are increasing risk. The ones on the, on the bottom in green are factors that decrease risk. And so for terrain, this is kind of what we're looking for. For um, conditions, meaning snowpack and weather, this is what we're looking for. For human factors, um, these are the factors that both increase and decrease risk. So we don't have enough, enough time to go into all these right now, but by far the best way to reduce your risk is through terrain because conditions, snowpack and weather, can be very fickle and human factors can be even more fickle. And especially these uh, deep slab instabilities, they're very, very difficult to predict even for the pros. So really your only choice is to go to very conservative terrain. And that means this quadrant right here. You go to safer steepness, safer consequences, a favorable aspect, good anchors, or you're on a, the above the slope instead of on the slope. So let me explain some of these things. So basic terrain management, if we strip it down to the essentials here, we have steepness, thick anchors like trees can help hold the slab in place, and then there's also consequences. So let me go through these one at a time. As far as steepness goes, <clears throat> you notice in the middle of the graph here, these are the number of avalanches that have occurred through uh, the steepnesses from both Swiss and Canadian data. From, so for about 35 degrees to about 43 degrees, this is really the prime avalanche terrain, which I've colored in red here. And then it drops off, you notice, both on the steeper side and on the gentler side. So you notice we have yellow light and green light conditions both on the steeper side and the gentler side. The extreme riders uh, are actually safer up here on the really, really steep slopes because they slough off often enough that they don't build up into slabs. But most of us mere mortals, we're existing on this gentle side of the curve here. So the way we reduce risk is we usually have to go in this direction towards gentler terrain. Consequences. <clears throat> so a terrain trap like a gully can be very dangerous. Even small avalanches can bury you very deeply in the bottom of the gully. And then if there's trees, so an avalanche, if it starts above trees or in sparse trees, these things suddenly turn into giant baseball bats that are trying to beat you to death. It feels like you're going through the giant bread slicer stuck in high gear. So trees can be very, very dangerous. Large uh, terrain like cliffs, uh, rocks, crevasses, of course, can be very dangerous, or just plain large avalanche paths with a large, long ride down can be very dangerous. So those are consequences. What happens if it slides? Okay, let's combine all this stuff together. 
here's dangerous terrain up here. Uh, this is prime time, 35 to 45 degrees, more or less. And dangerous consequences, of course, make dangerous terrain. Uh, medium, uh, so 32 to 35, or steeper than 45 degrees. Remember, it does actually get steeper on this, or less dangerous on the steep side. Combined with moderate consequences, make medium terrain, and so on. Safe terrain with safe consequences is usually safe terrain. Make sense? So if we have thick anchors, we could probably move down one level. Uh, they have to be thick, so you can hardly ride through them for them to be effective. Not sparse anchors, because they don't really help very much, but they have to be thick. So let's plot some of this stuff on the real-life situation. Here we have a probability consequences up here. So probability means likelihood that you're going to trigger the avalanche based on steepness and um, anchors. Uh, just sticking with terrain uh, here, not talking about the snowpack. So if we have this little slope down here, it's a test slope, I would call it. So, you know, the probability is pretty high because it's steep. It's uh, on the shady side of the slope. It doesn't have very many anchors right there. So probability is pretty high, but the consequences are low. So I would plot it in there. Okay. A similar slope that's facing the same direction, same kind of steepness, but it's a whole lot different. The consequences are really bad. You're on a bigger slope, and that'll take you right into this terrain trap up here, kind of a gully or a bench where it'll pile up very deeply. So I would plot that red light. So bad place to be. Let's look at Kessler Peak, God's Lawnmower, which a lot of people know. In the thick trees here, the thick tree, these trees are probably thick enough and, and it's about the and it's not too steep. So I would say the probability of triggering an avalanche there is fairly low. And so um, I would plot it down in here. But the trouble is if you're on a skis or snowboard and you're skinning up, a lot of people go up through these trees and they get up into here. Suddenly the trees thin out, so they're not effective as anchors anymore. And then look what happens to the consequences. If you trigger an avalanche here, you're going through the bread slicer. And look at through this bread slicer. There's absolutely no way in the world you're going to survive this avalanche going through a bread slicer like this and then dumping you onto a steep, big slope like this and then go down through more bread slicers all the way to the bottom. So very dangerous terrain. Notice you've gone from fairly safe terrain down here into dangerous terrain before you even realize it. Out in the middle of God's lawnmower, if you, it's actually safer here because you have probably more chance of triggering an avalanche here than up here, but at least you have a little bit better chance of surviving the avalanche out here where you have a little bit cleaner ride. So now this I wouldn't call safe terrain, but it's at least a little bit safer than up here, and it's kind of counterintuitive. A lot of people uh, are, uh, kind of get this one wrong. Okay, let's go to some bigger terrain. This is, happens to be in Canada. Little test slope there. You uh, remember this from the four. It's probably a green light condition. But let's take the same slope, this uh, same steepness, same aspect, but just different elevation, and look at the consequences up there. Absolutely no way to survive that. Absolutely impossible. So that's definitely red light. You get over here, and uh, <clears throat> same kind of probability, but at least you have a chance of getting a clean ride and surviving um, in some conditions. So it's kind of plots in there. So I hope that makes sense as a way to uh, evaluate terrain. Now, with deep slab instability, it's very important to sh choose very conservative terrain. And this is how you do it, because the deep slab instabilities, there's really no way to predict which slopes are going to slide and which are not going to slide. Even the pros, it's very difficult. So you either avoid them or you just choose very conservative terrain. That's the only way we can do this. Okay, so um, makes sense. Dangerous terrain, medium terrain, usually safe terrain based on probability and consequences like I just explained. Okay, well, I hope that helps uh, to... Uh, to talk a little bit about deep slabs and how to manage them as far as terrain goes. And thanks for tuning in. Stay safe.